And now it is time to invite on the stage our second speaker, Dees Colley, a pioneering leader in machine learning and artificial intelligence, currently CEO of Kaggle. Dick Scully's work on ethical and well-grounded IA system will offer fascinating insights into the future of technology. Please welcome. Hi, hello. It, um, is this mic on? Oh, wow. It really is on. So we're going to be setting up my lovely little table here, um, just so we don't hit any of the... On this side, please. Any of the issues here? Um, so it is an absolute honor to be here with this group of amazing brains, amazing thinkers, and amazing humans. Um, I'm super thankful to FIDE for the invitation to speak here. Uh, I was asked to talk about chess, finance, and AI in 15 minutes. A little bit to cover here, so we're going to give it a shot, uh, but bear with me. Um, so. Chess and AI have a huge history, going all the way back to the days of Alan Turing, who is in many ways the father of modern computer science and the father of artificial intelligence. Uh, and I think to really understand uh, AI and chess, we need to understand this position. This position is not from one of my games just now, although it could have been. I was playing black. Um, this position is a draw. If you are playing a chess engine from 1980 or a chess engine from a first year graduate student. Because if you can only see ahead 10 moves, you have no idea how to execute the checkmate. And I've seen this happen. It is so fun to feel like a smug human and watch the poor chess AI engine move the rook back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and finally give up after 50 moves draw. So clearly, we need to move beyond looking ahead 10 moves to do something useful here, right? So as we look ahead, move by move, we hit a branching factor. Now here I've drawn it as a branching factor of two because I'm not a good artist. But really in chess, the branching factor is 20 or 30. Which means that if we want to look ahead one more ply, one more half move, unless we're doing something interesting or, or clever uh, on the computation side, we've just increased our cost by 20 or 30x for one half move. This is no way to live. So we need to do something smarter, because there's no way for us to capture all of uh, the complexity of chess. As, as some of you know and are maybe fond of qu quoting, there are more chess uh, possible positions than there are atoms in the universe. So we need to be smarter here. Um, for a while, we were able to get by on the growth of Moore's Law. Anybody heard of Moore's Law? Yeah, a couple of folks here. Moore's Law was maybe the most important thing of the last century. This is maybe the most important graph of the last 20th, 20th yeah, last century or so. I pity the poor people in the back who might not be able to see that on our vertical axis, we are counting the number of transistors that fit on a little chip. And they might not be able to see that that is on a log scale which means that every two years or so, for the last roughly 70 years, we have been doubling the amount of computational power available for a fixed cost. Doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling, which is pretty cool. Now, you might notice the keen of you might see that this graph stops at 2020, and it's now 2024. There are some questions about what's going to continue here, and those, those are probably topics for another day. But even this doubling and doubling and doubling won't get us all the way to brute force AI for chess. We need to be a little bit smarter. Unfortunately, there are smart, some smart people out in the world. Some of them have won Nobel Prizes recently, and that's a good idea. Um, but we've probably all in this room heard that neural networks have been useful for chess, useful at creating stronger chess engines like AlphaZero or Leela or similar things, Stockfish, NNUE. Um, What's going on? Has anybody ever seen inside a neural network? We've been talking about these things a lot. Anybody looked inside one? No, no hands. OK, so let's look inside really quickly. Here's the world's stupidest neural network. Uh, and then if you take an um, introductory machine learning class, this is the sort of thing we'll start off with. We've got some training data, which are our little circles here. 
some are blue and some are orange, and we're trying to learn a model that can separate the blue uh, circles from the orange circles. And that separator prediction is shown by the background color here. So I have a very simple model here. It basically learns a line, and it can separate these two things, and we get an AR in our first project. Great. Um, but what happens if we get a more complicated pattern to learn? Now our simple model doesn't do such a good job. We might need to add in some little complexities. And so we start stacking these lines on top of each other, these little linear separators with a nonlinearity. And we might learn something that's doing a better job than our stupid model, but probably not a great job just yet. And as we add neurons, which we call these little units in our neural network, we get a tighter and tighter fit. Now, you might notice that this fit is pretty good, but it's probably not perfect. And you might have heard things like, oh, AI sometimes hallucinate. What does that hallucination look like? Well, it looks like one of these little orange areas that appears in an area where there is no data to contradict it. And so as humans, we might look at that and say, mm, that's a little bit suspicious. But the model's like, well, I don't know that I'm wrong. Prove it. So um, obviously, that's a, a relatively small model. Um, as we add more and more neurons, and, and current models have many billions of them, uh, we get more and more capacity and more and more performance out of our systems. And so I, I showed you the most important graph from the last 100 years. This, in my opinion, is the most important graph from the last five years. Um, and this is a graph that basically says that as you increase the amount of data or model complexity or, or things of this sort, you lower the error rate linearly. So as we double and double and double the amount of resources that we're putting into our models, we're increasing our, our um, model's ability at a linear rate. Now you might think to yourself, wait a minute. If I need exponentially more resources to get linearly more benefit, maybe I'm running into a bit of a problem at some point. And you would be right. So. Um, uh, experts will note that this isn't the only version of this graph. Uh, there have been plenty of others put in here. But because of this simple fact, it is easy for us to say with real clarity that efficiency and gains in efficiency are the number one driver for progress in AI. So if you care about AI, care about efficiency. Um, and this is true for all sorts of models. And what's interesting is that over time, especially in the last year or so, there have become much more efficient models, like versions of ChatGPT, like versions of Google's Gemini, that are radically more efficient than we thought possible. So we're making progress there. But we want to make more progress, which is why we've uh, partnered with FIDE to put together an efficient chess AI challenge. And in this, we have cruelly and um, cleverly restricted the amount of computational resources available to participants in this competition, in this competition so that they will be uh, required to come up with extremely efficient um, algorithms and methods. Uh, this competition is ongoing. If you want to participate, you can, because it's super fun. Um, but you'll notice that many of the folks who are currently at the top of this leaderboard are folks who are um, well-versed in the open source um, chess AI community. And you'll also notice that some of the very top people have a separation of about 200 ELO points right now from uh, a version of one open source model that was just a stripped down version to sort of see as a baseline. So we're seeing very, very good improvements here already in efficiency. All right, so what does all this mean for finance? Um, that's a reasonable question. So I believe that uh, the connection between being able to predict efficiently and to be able to do a good job in the financial world are tightly connected. I'm not an expert, but I think if you can make good predictions, you can probably make some money off of that. Um, What's interesting, so uh, at Kaggle, we run machine learning competitions. Um, right now, we're working with Jane Street. Anybody here from Jane Street? Yeah, one? Only you know, half a hand, sort of, from Jane Street? All right. Um, so we're working with Jane Street uh, to run a competition on financial markets forecasting. And the good people of Jane Street have pointed out that you basically might think that this problem is impossible to do well. And they're probably right from a theoretical standpoint and from a classical statistics standpoint. And yet, these models do seem in practice to work really well. It's one of the great mysteries of life. So um, we're 
seeing amazing um, applications of these models every day. Now you might think, okay, well this is great if you're working at, at a, um, a quant fir um, firm or if you're an ML PhD, but what, what, what do normal people do in this world? Can, can anybody who doesn't have infinite scale resources make a difference? And I believe that the answer to that is yes. Because one of the really surprising things to me that's happened is that these methods have become widely accessible and usable. For example, you can use a model like Gemini in very sophisticated ways without ever having to write code. And you can do um, various forms of prompt engineering and fine tuning that change model behavior in sophisticated ways as a complete um, uh, non-coder if you wish. If you can code, you can do some more things. That's interesting too. But this is super accessible. Um, and this is true even if you want to do things like um, chain of thought reasoning or other forms of control flow. Another thing that's interesting is you might say, well, if I can't train a model with you know, many, many uh, huge piles of data or a ton of compute, what do I do? Well, it turns out that open models like Google's Gemma or Meta's Llama um, are models that allow non-experts without a ton of resources to be able to build on those models and train them and fine tune them for their own needs. And so we see models like Gemma being broadly adopted and then fine tuned for use cases uh, that range everywhere from privacy uh, sensitive applications all the way to being fine tuned to um, languages that don't typically make it into top 40 on the web. Super interesting. One more thing I'll say here is that as these models are becoming more capable, we're seeing interesting new modalities emerge. So if you've played with models like Gemini or ChatGPT, you might have typed in some text prompts. But actually, these models are now becoming very good at dealing with images and video as well. And this, again, changes the rules in an interesting way. It allows us to interact with these models in much more powerful ways and come up with things like this um, winning, winner in a Kaggle competition on using long context windows, where this person said, you know, it's a pain in the neck to keep track of all of the different items in my house that might need insurance coverage. So what this person did was use Gemini and a video of their house to automatically label and um, store all of the different um, items that need to be insured in their house in a super fast, super easy way. They then got Gemini to write code to turn this into an app. And so with very little engineering effort relative to the complexity here, we have a super useful, super interesting thing. And the goal is, of this isn't to say that this is the best use, although it's a very interesting use. It's to spark imagination about what these models might be able to do in the future if you apply your thoughts to them, because we need your ideas. So the last thing is that you might have heard that these models are starting to get good at reasoning. And what is, what is reasoning? I, th I think it's a, a tricky thing to wrap your head around uh, in terms of like, can you come up with a really clear definition? But for me, it's the sort of thing that happens when you tell a student, don't just solve the problem, but please show your work. When you show your work, you often end up showing a step-by-step uh, step -step reasoning process that helps to not only show the world what you did and why they should trust it, but also actually improves the quality of the work. And we're seeing these things happen um, very quickly right now. So we have a competition running right now for AI for solving math problems, uh, for solving coding problems, and for solving abstract reasoning problems. So all of these things are incredibly interesting to me. Um, I believe that they signal kind of a paradigm shift where in the classical machine learning or AI of a really long time ago, like 2018, at that time, all of the onus was on people collecting big data and then using that to build their own models. And I believe that where we are right now is an era of people collecting really good questions. And so being a great question asker is probably the single best skill for, for AI moving forward. So, with that, I will say thank you.